My dudes, what's happening? This is Trent. And uh, one of the things that I always wanted to do is I always wanted to make an, an indie game. And so last year I just went ahead and I, I did it. And I didn't want to quit my day job because, hey, making indie games, it's a highly competitive business and there's very difficult to stand out. It's almost like playing the lottery. So I wanted to hold on to what it is that I do best, which is pretty much doing concept art for contracts and things. And that's what my, my team and my company does. But I was able to put together an indie game with my free time, just about 10 to 16 hours a week on average, give or take a couple of weeks where I spent more time on it. So I wanted to break down the process of everything that you would need to in order to make your own indie game in your free time while not quitting your day job. All right, dudes, let's break it down into a few different steps. First of all, before I dive into it, why not quit your day job and go whole hog and risk it all on your big, uh, cool idea? Uh, the reason is because every single year, about 10,000 new games are released on Steam, and that number is climbing by about 25% every single year. So it's highly competitive, and if you risk it all, you might end up homeless. And I don't want to encourage anybody to take that kind of risk. Build some momentum and strategy before you make a big jump like that. Okay, disclaimers out of the way. Now, where do we begin? We start with your big idea. What's your big idea? Now, I don't recommend you actually start with a big idea. A lot of times people say, hey, I want to make an MMO or I want to make a big AAA game. But if you do the calculations on that, you're going to need about 30 to 40 million dollars to develop a big AAA game like that. It's better to plan something out that's on the scope of something that one or two people could do. Start with a simple idea. In my case, I started with an idea that was somewhat similar to old classic games like Mega Man or Meat Boy. The mechanics are simple. It's just a variable jump and you're surviving the environment. You don't have to deal with a lot of AI or managing inventory or tons and tons of uh, NPCs or anything like that. I'm trying to keep it within a scope of something that I could learn on my own because I'm going to have to program all this myself. Don't go too deep with this. This is why I didn't do Twilight Monk. I did something totally new because I didn't want to be bound by the story or logic of anything that came before it. Hence why we have Aikido the Scrap Hunter. Write that down on a piece of paper and it should explain what's going to be compelling and unique about your game. Now keep in mind you've got a lot of competition out there so you're going to want something that's simple but also very very compelling and unique and something ideally that visually people can see what's unique about it right out of the get-go. Keep your description short and simple and even bullet points are a very ideal way to put these initial ideas down on paper because they are going to change. This will act as your one sheet, your lighthouse, your guide throughout every other decision that you're going to make throughout this project. Step two, you're gonna to need to learn to program this thing. Now there are a lot of different engines that you could choose from, Game Maker Studio to Unreal to Unity and now Godot and many, many other ones. I even started out using Skira Construct. I actually recommend if you're gonna do a 2D game, which I highly recommend for a small one to two man team, just do a 2D game using Game Maker Studio. Do not plan to do a 3D game in Game Maker Studio. If you want to do a 3D game, absolutely jump into Unreal or Unity Engine. In my case, I chose Game Maker Studio because there were a lot of tutorials by a guy named Benjamin. Uh, he goes by Heartbeast on YouTube. Definitely follow some of his tutorials. And another guy named Sean Spaulding. There are a lot of others out there, but uh, these guys also have exclusive courses that will walk you through the process of learning to make your own platformers and adventure games and real-time action games and, and uh, turn-based RPGs, all kinds of cool stuff. I actually recommend that you block out, you set aside about four months. Uh, that's not going to do it. You're going to need about a year, at least a minimum of a year, to really grasp the concepts behind an engine, any engine. During this time, you're going to understand state machines. You're going to understand game logic. You're going to understand how to create a little bit of fun. And you're going to want to go off the rails from those uh, from those tutorials. In fact, I started to develop little other types of platformers. And, and uh, I started making a little Creed game. And I started making a little balloon flying game. And I started making a variety of programming experiments, you know, to try out all the new things that I was learning in the in that engine, knowing very well that it was all going to get thrown away. This was all pre-production. This was all preparing for the project. It's a good chunk of time just getting ready to make your first game. I mean, sure, I'd shipped probably about 20 AAA games, but I'd never programmed a game before. I'd never done game design like this before. There is a big distinction between the R&D mode, the exploration and understanding how an engine works and, and building your systems and actually creating content for your game. There was a lot of quitting and then a lot of starting again. So really this took me a couple of years. By this point, you should have loads of broken prototypes of things that will never go anywhere. And that's okay because that's part of the learning process. The most successful indie game developers do game jam where they just put together entire games within a matter of a week or less. Fall out of love with the results and fall in love with the process, the beating your head against the wall, the overcoming challenges. Step three is to go back to your original document and start to break it down into actionable items. For instance, at this point, you might say, well, it's I think I need to work out that heart container system. 
take that item from your list, set aside one week in your calendar. I use Mac calendars and focus on that one task for that one week. If you have to do some tutorials, research, whatever, figure it out, get it in the game. It might be rough, but get it in. Don't get stuck on one feature, move on. You're gonna wanna gray box your stages. You're gonna want to figure out if you're gonna have text in your, in your NPCs, if you're gonna have NPCs at all, if you're gonna have any kind of story, figure that out now. How do you make a cutscene? Now, if you're an artist by nature uh, and you're at this stage, you're gonna wanna jump the gun. You're gonna wanna jump right into making it beautiful as all hell. You're gonna wanna create visuals that stun and floor people, but that would be a grave error because you don't yet have any unique gameplay systems in place to even even know what kind of art you can do. So for instance, if you've got depths uh, that aren't working with the parallaxing, you've got to figure out how parallaxing works first. You got to know how much uh, particles you can have on the screen at one time before it starts to hog your memory and things like that. Hell, at this point, you don't even know what resolution you can do. In fact, uh, I learned this the hard way. Don't go and do anything larger than a uh, pixel art style uh, for a 2D game in Game Maker Studio. Trust me on that one. I learned it the hard way. It takes way too long to compile the whole game just to find out whether or not that little line of code worked. During this time, you're going back to that initial game design document and you're going, okay, well, maybe I need simpler enemies or maybe I need no enemies or maybe I need these types of moving blocks or these types of physical challenges because you're gonna be playing testing a lot, you're going to find a lot of bugs and you're going to find a lot of your own limitations. <laughs> so scale your game based on that. The key thing that you're looking for here is to find the fun. You're, you're finding the fun in the gameplay. And what I mean by that is that there was a distinct moment when I was making this initial prototype of a platformer where I found that it was really fun to time your jumps uh, based on when you landed on a platform, it would fall out from under you. And then if you tried to ascend a tower with the platforms constantly falling out from under you, it created this interesting tension with the gravity. So I took that key moment of fun that everybody that play tested it was enjoying this tension and reward, and I exploited that. That was the whole basis for the Aikido game. Conversely, if anything wasn't fun, I cut it. This is exactly how most games are actually developed. They're looking for the fun, and that's not something you can quantify, it's something that you find through trial and error and playtesting. So a great example of this is uh, Blizzard was developing a game called Titan, and it had a lot of features. It had too many features, really. So we set out to make the most ambitious thing that you could possibly imagine, and it didn't come together. Morheim continued, we didn't find the fun. This has been the core philosophy of every successful developer I've ever worked with. Whatever the case, when the team sat down and really asked themselves what part of our game is actually fun, they found that the arena battles were the most fun. So they took all the art assets from Titan, everything that they had been building and the themes and the concepts, and they applied them to the part of the game that was actually fun. And they made that the focus, the singular focus of the game. And that's why we have Overwatch. So find your fun, then exploit it. And what I mean by that is take that singular mechanic or feature or whatever it is and start to find creative ways to build off of that. So you've got the fun, now you're challenging that fun with new additions that all compile on top of that foundation. You're not straying, you're not going in a totally different direction, you're going with the part that's already working, the fun part. That fun should be there whether or not you've got graphics involved at all. You could be jumping around a, a gray block <laughs> on top of other gray blocks and it should still be fun because art doesn't freaking matter. What matters is the fun. Step five, take off your designer hat. Now it's all about art, <laughs> what you wanna do. And what I did anyway was I built a singular stage that was my proof of concept. I decided to take a chunk that was, the, here's the beginning and here's the end and here's the sense of reward that you're gonna get when you complete that stage. At this point, I was about eight months into development. This is where I began to learn about how, how uh, graphically intensive I can make my stages. How much artwork can I put into there and still stay on budget of my time? And what I mean by a proof of concept is essentially that this should be a self-contained explanation of the best parts of your game. When you hand the controller to a player, they should immediately get a sense of what your whole game is gonna be about. Don't give them a cutscene or a stage one where the player has no abilities at all. Give them something that shows them exactly what your game is gonna be about in its peak moment of fun. And a great example of this is when I was working at Capcom, we were building this game that was about a character who was breaking out of slavery and then he was later gonna have all these cool weapons and gadgets, but we made the mistake of building the prototype where he was still a slave trying to break out of the ship. And so when we showed it to Inafune and all the other higher ups over at Capcom, they were like, why do I wanna play as a guy with no weapons or abilities in a loincloth? They shut down the whole project, almost canned the whole studio. It still turned out better than Mighty Number no. 9, but man, it wasn't fun. No, if this were a story arc, if this this would be act two, the fun and games. Show us all the coolest abilities that make the gameplay the most unique and fun and interesting. So at this point, you wanna actually show your 
polished prototype single stage to people. And you're gonna want to see not just what they're telling you, you're going to want to see how they're reacting to what it is that they're playing. Just absorb yourself in the game, <laughs> in the universe of Aikida. Okay. Well, you figured out the run jump pretty quickly. Well, I think you'd mentioned it to me before. Okay. <laughs> okay. So I can just, whoa. While you're watching people play your game in person, you wanna watch their reactions. Are they dazzled? Are they frustrated? Are they inspired? Are they excited? Are they asking lots of questions about what comes up next? Are they uh, trying out ways of solving problems that you didn't anticipate? Because that's where you're going to learn how the player thinks. Don't forget to take lots of photos of their facial expressions so that you can embarrass them on your YouTube channel later. Coming out of this, you should have a good idea of like what's working and what's not working. Now this would be a good point to decide whether or not you wanna even finish the project. You know, you might get the play test back and people go, ah, this is nothing. And that happened to many of my early prototype things, you know. You'd also have to evaluate, well, let's see, if I make it a much longer game, is there going to be more here? If you look at the dev blogs for things like Celeste, for instance, they built a prototype and they found that it was fun, so they built a bigger game. The same thing happened with um, Hollow Knight as well. If the response is insane, you might very well go, hey, maybe it's time to do that Kickstarter, or hey, maybe it's time to find that publisher. But keep in mind, if you work with a publisher, most of the time they're gonna wanna own the game that, that you're making. So you know, that's exactly why we don't have a Twilight Monk game, for instance, because I ain't handing over the rights to Twilight Monk to anybody, you know, even if it is Nintendo. But you're gonna need some money for paying a musician or animators or any other help that you might need. So it's time to evaluate how big of a project you wanna make. Step nine, finish making your game. It's as easy as that. No, I'm just kidding. Okay, so when you're finishing out your game, you're gonna wanna pay attention to the flow of things. Is it getting repetitive? Do you wanna switch it up by maybe adding like a cool flying stage in between a couple of the platforming stages? Do you wanna have like a cool boss fight at the very end of your game that has like a, a real test of their skills of everything that you've been teaching them and challenging them with throughout the whole game? Make sure that despite you sitting down and playing it for over a thousand hours already, that you're still having fun playing the game that you're working on. If not, then maybe it's time to trash it and move on. Just start over, just start over, throw it all out, just start over. You can take your knowledge with you at least. Step 10 is to release your game on Steam. Now you can release on itch.io and that's okay, but Steam is where everybody actually buys games. And their interface is outdated and difficult to use. I literally almost quit at the damn finish line because Steam is too difficult to figure out how to upload to. But once you get your game out there, then the reviews start pouring in or you know, you still gotta spread the word somehow so you have to have some kind of a marketing strategy. And I guess that's technically step number 11 is marketing, but this video isn't about marketing because it's a whole other beast. But it's really cool when you start to actually get reviews from people and they give very valuable, thoughtful feedback that allows you to make a better game. It helps you to improve as a game developer. I wish I could have gotten that feedback earlier in the development process. But as it stands right now, the reviews, the rating is really high, I would say. And maybe part of that is because it's a free game, but the downside is because there's no, because it's a free game, there's no budget for marketing. <laughs> so catch 22. It's what you call a chicken egg situation. So there you have it. That's pretty much the breakdown of the steps I went through. There was a lot of trial and error and I learned a lot from the experience. In fact, I would say that's the most valuable thing uh, that I got out of the whole thing is that I can say I'm an indie game developer, solo indie game developer. I was able to do that on my own. I have a greater appreciation for all the systems that go into making an indie game. The game did not make a lot of profit because I put it out there for free. You know, you start out doing something small, you learn from everything that you've done, you compound that, and then the next game you learn how to make a better game. In fact, I would say that that's probably the best part about just getting your, your first game out there, do something really simple and small so that you can learn the experience of actually releasing a game on Steam, looking at statistics, looking at how people are playing it, how they're consuming it, how they're sharing it, and how they're rating it, how they're reviewing it. And then you start to realize, well, geez, I need to put more uh, attention into marketing and getting reviews on this thing if I wanna reach a bigger audience. So the whole thing was really just about understanding the atmosphere, understanding the environment. What is it like to be releasing games as a publisher in the indie game space? So that's it for me on this video. Again, I wanna encourage you to go and check out that game. It is free to play. And if you do a video about it, I'd love to watch you play it. That's the most fun part about the whole experience for me is watching people enjoy the game. And uh, dudes, I got more art videos coming for you next week. So until next time, I'll catch y'all. Come on, Yandabon. And ciao, baby. Oh yeah.